I didn't have this microphone, but this is for the people who are watching online, and we know there are some, and also for one of our artists zooming in. So um, if we get to a question and answer portion, I hope you will use this microphone. Um, welcome to the Brodsky Gallery opening for Unsovereign Elements, Geological Poetics in Contemporary Art from the Caribbean and its Diaspora. Welcome. Yes, that deserves an applause, yes. Um, this show, it's a group exhibition curated by the amazing, amazing, extraordinary creative Cecilia Gonzalez Colina. She's Woo! right there. This, it's a rich interdisciplinary show. There's so much to see, so much to look at, things you can actually touch. There's some participatory elements. It's, a, it's an extraordinary collection of ideas and practices, and um, I'm excited to be here with all of you tonight um, as we get to talk about it and hear about it and then engage with the art. Um, we here at Writers House are honored to be part of this, uh, to be supporters and co-sponsors among a huge list of people who I know Cecilia will mention. Um, so before I hand the microphone over to Cecilia, who will help contextualize things, tell you about some of the artists in the show, um, I just want to say that working with you has been a singular pleasure. Um, you have devoted an extraordinary amount of effort and energy and creativity and um, fearlessness, I think, about approaching spaces and space. And you've been committed to a vision over many, many months, I should say. So please help me welcome Cecilia gonzalez Godina to the podium. Yeah, this is working. Um, well, first, thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm going to be thanking you a lot, I think. <laughs> and my list of thanks is going to be really long, so please bear with me. Um, I'm going to try to talk for maybe five to ten minutes top, so we can have more time for the conversation with this fabulous artist, the scholar, virtually. Hi, Yolanda. <laughs> um, and later, um, you're all welcome to stay um, around, see, like, tour around the exhibition and we'll have a, a small re reception as well. Um, so yes, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start by thanking, of course, um, the whole staff of Kelly Writers House, Jessica, Zach, um, and everyone that has um, been helping me make this possible. It has been challenging. We've made a lot of um, changes in the last 24 hours, but it has turned out to be actually better because of the obstacles. So thank you very much um, in that sense. Of course, I want to thank all the artists. Um, thank you for trusting me. I know I'm nobody, and I really appreciate the trust you've put, it, um, you've put on me. This has been an amazing experience for me as well. It is my first um, solo show as curator, so thank you. I really, really appreciate it. And also you being here physically, it is really beautiful to be able to talk to you in person. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank um, also Yolanda Martinez San Miguel. Um, she's online. I don't know if we're gonna be able to actually see your face, um, but she's in the screen. Um, and yeah, thank you, Yolanda, for engaging with us and like accepting to be part of this conversation. It is a special honor for me because I've been reading her work for so long that it is some sort of this like fun moment. Um, uh, I want to thank you to thank as well my advisor Odette Casamayor Cisneros. Thank you for your trust. Thank you for bearing with me and um, also for motivating me to do all these things. I really appreciate. I know it it is a lot, and I I am really thankful. So thank you. And well, and now I'm gonna start with a list of <laughs> people and institutions that have sponsored, funded, supported this project from the very first moment. I want to thank the Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies class. Thank you, Kathy, for being here. Um, the Center for Experimental Ethnography, the Center for Africana Studies, the Penn Program in Environmental Humanities, the Prize Lab for Digital Humanities, the Wolf Humanities Center, and the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this wouldn't have been possible like at all if um, all these institutions wouldn't, um, weren't part of this project. 
And finally, the special thanks for the Campaign for Community, the GAPSA Provost Fellowship for Interdisciplinary in Innovation, and the Writer's House Student Initiatives Fund for their generous support. So um, I think it is. it makes sense that the final thanks is for all of you for being here. Thank you. Um, I consider many of you like really close friends, so thank you so much for being here and for supporting me with this. Um, so yes, as I said, I will try to be really brief so we have more time for the panel and conversation later. Um, so I will just give some context on the questions that drive the exhibition, um, but later we can actually talk more if, you, if any of you have any questions. So I actually want to start with a quote by Martinican thinker Edouard Glissant, um, and I quote now, history is spread out beneath the surface, from the mountains to the sea, from north to south, from the forest to the beaches. Our landscape is its own monument. Its meaning can only be traced on the underside. It is all history, end of quote. So, and sovereign elements, um, geological poetics in contemporary art from the Caribbean and its diaspora, is a living project that explores the relationship between geological elements and natural phenomena in the configuration of the Caribbean and in the articulation of Caribbean identities. This exhibition is actually the first iteration of many upcoming um, happenings, which will be in the form of exhibitions, screenings, workshops, conversations, symposiums, among many others. And these will take place in different places, echoing um, the diasporic experience of the archipelago. Um, this exhibition features the multimedia work of 11 artists, for now, whose work engages with the ambiguous role of natural elements and phenomena in the reproduction of the Caribbean archipelago. And here, um, I am referring to the Caribbean not, not as a particular or centered place, but more as a decentered space whose physical, conceptual, and symbolic limits are untraceable. So the question here, for us to start, is where does the archipelago begin and end? Caribbean cultural expression, and not limited to art, is highly permeated by submarine geological and atmospheric aesthetics. But these are too often enclosed within frameworks of unavoidable catastrophe or fetishized tropicalism that posit the geological as either a destructive or a picturesque force. However, this project explores how these elements, and you'll see many around the sea, um, currents, minerals, jungles, so although they have been exhausted and extracted by modernity, they retain a poetic potential that exceeds their materiality and their stereotype narratives that do often determine the Caribbean region. So these artists are all staging in different ways with color, sound, video, textile, organic matter even, the tension between the figurative control of nature and its internal impossibility. So of course, to talk about nature in this context establishes a continuity between the bodies of nature and the bodies of flesh, the actual bodies inhabiting the space. And we can see, for example, materialize this continuity in the work of Nadia Huggins. You can see it over there. And we can actually see how um, the bodies are continuous with the geological. So, and, but other strategies to rearticulate re the relationship between the geological and the human are the juxtaposition of geological and historical times and histories through collage, for example, the erasure of imposed borders, limits, or narratives, or the dislocation of stereotyping gazes, for example, in Joy de Minaya's postcards, that I'm gonna say it now, you can actually take with you. <laughs> I don't wanna put a sign that says, please take, so you're all advised to take one if you want. Um, and I want to finalize by saying that this project will continue to grow and archive other geological perspectives. The idea behind is that archipelagic nature has functioned and still functions as an unsovereign geological archive, understanding the word geological as the logic emerging from the constitutive relationship between landscape, identity, and history in the Caribbean. And, of course, the notion of unsovereignty, which I draw from Yarimar Bonilla's um, formulations. And the unsovereign as a and as an open category for everybody of flesh, of nature, and of knowledge, whose power resides not in its figurative and conceptual agency, but in its ecological and, re and relational agency. So in conclusion, you, you're gonna see how here geological elements are a fact of continuity, as they are in, in the actual representation, representations and, pre and representations of the, of the region. 
and how they act not, not only as products of the violent processes of extractions, but as archives of exploitation that bear witness to the violence exerted on colonized bodies. So some of the questions that we are trying to um, approach with this exhibition and this project are what happens when the seminal human land relationship is dislocated by dispossession and forced transplantation? Or how are these underside continuities between colonized bodies of flesh, of nature, and of knowledge staged in both colonial and non-colonial representations of the Caribbean identity and memory? So um, we're going to have more time to talk later about this, but please join me now in welcoming um, Thelma Banahi, Lilian Garcia Roy, and Yolanda Martinez San Miguel, which now we can actually <laughs> see. Um, so, well, thank you again, everybody, for being here. So yeah, I'm gonna actually Odette, which I mentioned before, my advisor, she's gonna introduce um, the three presenters. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> of course, of course. And I actually um, okay, we need the, the microphone. And I actually, well, of course, I want to, of course, to introduce you, especially my uh, one of the scholars I admire the most and Caribbean studies, which is Yolanda. Um, Martinez and Miguel. But before, yes, I want to really say how uh, proud I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, because just for her presentation right now, so you can um, realize how deep is uh, the work that she is doing and how, and this is why it is so important for me. Um, the words of the exhibition and all the events, because it's not only the exhibition, there is a, a, a panoply of events that are associated to it. And she just, she organized it, and she, she, was, she has been great. I mean, Cecilia. And uh, why also is so important for me? Because it's, uh, this kind of events and this kind of, uh, of not only the, the events, but the whole situation. Um, makes me happy in the sense that I realize how, this is what we, we are looking for through a scholarship, is to make it as available as, po as possible, just to make it walk outside of the classroom. And uh, for, her present, for her presentation right now, you gather that it's not just um, a, um, an exhibition of wonderful incredible, um, um, great um, artwork. But it is also behind all this. There is the basis of this important, this deep, and this uh, solid knowledge that Cecilia uh, has been uh, developing. So that's why, I again, I will ask you first to say thank you to Cecilia <laughs> for doing all this, to congratulate her, yes. <laughs> so please. And and uh, yes, um, yes, this is um, so again more applause. And now, as I said, I, this is my actual job just to introduce. <laughs> so um, now, yes, I am. As I said, I am um, beyond uh, honored to introduce um, Yolanda Martinez San Miguel, uh, the and the artist Lilian Garcia Roy, and Thelma Vanna I. Okay, I said it right. Um, so Yolanda, which is, uh, as I said, is one of the um, artists, I'm sorry, one of the <laughs> scholars on Caribbean studies that uh, I admire the most. She, and why I said so, is because since the very beginning of my career, I have, uh, I have been reading her work, and I particularly remember that, word, that uh, book, Caribbean, um, Caribe Two Ways. Um, so the the compl the um, the whole title is Caribe Caribe Two Ways called Cultura y Migración el Caribe Hispánico, which was a great crowd, was ground groundbreaking as a book. Um, but well, the biography. Yolanda Martinez San Miguel <laughs> specializes in colonial, postcolonial, Latin American, and Caribbean literatures. Um, she currently teaches at, uh, so she is currently a professor at the University of Miami, but previously she taught here at Penn, uh, also at Princeton and Rutgers. Um, she recently co-edited two volumes, uh, one with Michelle Stevens, 
um, contemporary archipelagic thinking towards new comparative methodol methodologies and disciplinary formations, which is probably makes you think why she is uh, opening <laughs> this event. And the um, second one with uh, Santa Arias uh, is the Routledge Companion to Colonial Latin American and Caribbean Studies. She is currently working on her fifth book, Arch Arch Archipelagos de Ultramar, Comparative Ins Insular and Colonial Studies, which uses comparative archipelagic studies as a historical and theoretical framework to propose a research agenda for the study of cultural productions in the Caribbean and other colonial archipelagos between 1498 and 2010. She is the co-editor of the book series on critical Caribbean studies at Rutgers University Press. And um, Yolanda will be in conversation with uh, the artists. So, so uh, their works are also exhibited, are exhibited here. Uh, first, we have Lilian Garcia Roy, uh, she is a compatriot, she is um, a compatriota, she's <laughs> Cuban born. <laughs> uh, she's Cuban born, but Texas raised. Um, um, she's an artist living, currently living in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, her landscape themes, works, have uh, always explored the complex semiotic propositions um, of uh, place and belonging. And uh, she recently has embarked on a conceptual investigation of the idea of the Cuban landscape and, and how her American Bauhasian education has colored her relationships to, to place and space. These new works are part of the Echo con Cuba and Hyphenated, Natura, na, hyphenated Nature se series. She has shown at the Chopo Museum of, in Mexico City, the American Society Gallery in New York City, the, Na the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Army, the Art Museum of the Americans, of the Americans among, among others. Lillian Holtz, an MFA from the University of Pennsylvania, oh. welcome back, <laughs> and the BFA, <laughs> and a BFA from the Southern Methodist University. After being a tenured associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and a visiting professor at the University of California at Berkeley, she moved to Tallahassee, where she is currently a professor and chair of the Department of Art and Art at Florida State University. Major awards and um, residencies include, include a 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship, a Blackwell Prize in Painting, a John Mitchell Foundation Award in Painting, among others. And then we have also um, Thelma Banaí, um, and she's a Spanish Dominican visual artist and photographer based in Barcelona. Since ten, 20, 20, 2010, she has been <clears throat> developing extensive multidisciplinary projects with a participatory methodology around the Dominican culture and imaginaries, looking to provide a vision of identity while creating magical realism in scenarios with different tools. Her work revolves around fraternity between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, where the artist makes um, an, ex an exercise of repetition of the island that she accompanies with reflective, reflective text in her search for, of rescuing the importance of healing. Thelma's work has been exhibited in various artistic spaces, such as the Museo de Arte Moderno de Santo Domingo, the Image Center, or the Photo Imagens Festival in, or yeah, the Image Center, or the Photo Imagens, so, or, okay. or the Photo Imagen <laughs> Festival in the Dominican Republic. And she has participated in several group exhibitions in Barcelona uh, and opened her first solo show, congratulations, uh, in the city, in Barcelona, which is called Queloide, the exhibition, with uh, Tangent Projects. This was in 2021, in the middle of the pandemic. So, <laughs> so, so okay, so uh, please help me. Um, Welcoming these uh, wonderful artists, and let's start with uh, this incredible conversation. Thank you. So let's, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. 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 
Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I, I want to start by thanking Cecilia Gonzalez Godino and of course Odette Casamayor for this invitation. And I'm very happy to be at the Kelly Writers House, even you know virtually, because I remember many um, good events that were organized there during my time there. So I'm honored to actually participate in this conversation in a way I feel like out of my league. <laughs> uh, these artists are uh, have a, a long trajectory that, that made me learn a lot about the Caribbean. And so what I have are a series of questions to perhaps, um, you know, encourage you to talk a little bit about the things that people are going to see in the exhibit and in the rest of the events that are going to surround uh, the, the this, this series that, that Penn is uh, organizing. And so I wanted to start um, with Thelma. Um, and I had a question about um, your use of, of cartography, which I found very uh, provo thought provoking, particularly because it's one of the things that I enjoy as well. Um, but the way in which you are using or transforming cartography for uh, the for Caribbean, you know, to think about the Caribbean, uh, particularly the dialogue and this juxtaposition with um, mythical figures was very interesting. So I wanted for you to talk a little bit about uh, the use of cartography in your work. Well, uh, first I want to say thank you to Ceci for for this amazing exhibition. And thank you for all the people who are here. And well, uh, my, first, my first language is not the English. So the people who know my work, they know I, I read letters for the Iceland. So for me, it's very comfortable to read. And so I'm going to read some of the ideas that I have. And about this, about the, the why I chose the cartography in my work, so I, I chose the cartography because at the school, they always told me that I live on a half an Iceland. They didn't talk to me about Haiti or mention Haiti as a part of the Iceland. And that had a big impact of my imaginary, but not only in my imaginary, in the imaginary of other people. No? I talk with other people and they say me the same. And I notice how this affect that, no? How we talk about Haiti or what, how the Haitian people talk about Dominican Republic, no? Because they tell me in her country the same. They have the same uh, history about, they don't talk a lot about the Dominican part. So for me, that's very impact, no? Like, I don't see the Iceland, like, I just see half of the Iceland. So when Heidi, Heidi was mentioned, only the bad things about that part of the Iceland were mentioned and it seems very distant or disappear from the map, no? All the time I see like they don't, they don't are there, like they don't exist, no? All the time I see in that way. So thinking in Haiti, seeing it on the map allows me to not forget Forget it because it seems to disappear and reappear depending of the natural disaster, depending of uh, hung the hunger in the country, depending of the death of a president. And on the map, I present Haiti that is also a worthy place. No, it's not just all these problems. And Haiti is a worthy place, but that deserves to be seen out of the eye of misfortuness, no? Like this, mm -hmm. that um, Ceci talked about this in the beginning of the exposition. So that's why I take the cartography and that's why I put Haiti all the time. And well, I put all the Iceland, no? Mm -hmm. Some people sometimes tell me, oh, you want, you need the Iceland. Mm -hmm. No, I say, no, it's just one Iceland, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I don't try to do anything. I just want the people to see the Iceland, all the Iceland. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to be alternating between both of you so, so we right. can get to hear from both of you. And so Lillian, I'm going to uh, uh, 
switch to you and I'm uh, looking forward to meet you. Yeah, we're, we're neighbors in Florida and we haven't met in person, although I've heard about your work sure. and so very happy to be part of this conversation. And uh, I wanted to start with um, a question about uh, one of your, the, the, the pieces of one of your, uh, the title of one of your pieces is Hyphenated Nature. And uh, the, it made me think about the importance of the notion of the hyphen in studies of diaspora and in particular US Caribbean studies, right? Mm -hmm. But in the case of, of Cuba and, and the Cuban diaspora, my sense is that the hyphen is a little bit more complicated. And so I was curious about the way in which you use this notion in your work and the way you conceive the hyphen in the case of the Cuban, uh, in the Cuban case, and if you think it's, uh, that different from the rest of the experiences that other uh, diasporic subjects uh, have in the United States. Um, okay, well, so I wanna thank everybody first also, um, but I will jump into the question. Um, I think the hyphen from the artists that I've met from different parts of the Caribbean, it's something that they can relate to, even if it's just this idea of being bi, you know, bicultural or bi, having one foot in one country and one foot in the other. So for me, although it's been something that's been around, when I first read um, um, Fermat's book, uh, Life on the Hyphen, which came out in 1994, that was like a life changer for me um, because I always kind of intuitively sensed that I wasn't American enough, but then I wasn't Cuban enough. Um, and I hear this from a lot of people often, like the, uh, you'll, you'll hear this, you know, I'm not enough of this, I'm not enough of that. And my name is hyphenated. I was born with a hyphenated name. And when people ask me where I'm from, to this day, I still say, do you mean where I was born? Do you mean where I was raised? Or do you mean where I live now? And so I've never felt um, particularly from a place. And yet, um, although I don't, I, I left Cuba when I was very young. We were part of the first wave of the, or I was part of the last wave of the first group that left. So I didn't leave Cuba until 1968. Um, but I was still of that first group. So I have no firsthand memories of Cuba, and yet my whole life has been permeated by, you know, pero en Cuba, this, en Cuba, you know, we, don't, we can't do that here because in Cuba. So this idea of hyphen really um, made sense to me personally, but then in a formal way, what I found was that even while I was at Penn, um, I always naturally liked images that were both abstract and representational, right? That maybe left space for the viewer, but also had a multitude of things. I never liked the binary. And I was always asked, this was in the 80s, remember, too, right? You know, I was always told, you must choose. You have to be more abstract or more realistic. And I would always say, but why? I want to be both. And I didn't realize at the time, because there wasn't the language that we have now about, um, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of studies, right? In Caribbean studies where they kind of talk about um, that no one was really informing me of that. So all this was very intuitive. But the idea of the hyphen was very literal in my name, and it made sense in terms of putting pieces together. And actually, this, this particular work there is part of a series called Hyphenated Nature Series, and, and, it's, and it's juxtaposing some of my perceptually based on-site landscape practice, which I do in Florida, I, with uh, some conceptually based work made with Cuban dirt that does kind of mash up. It's, it's basically me repainting um, a famous painting by, by Carta, a Cuban uh, painter whose work I've seen in the museum. Um, so I kind of repainted part of that because it reminded me of some of the paintings I had painted on site. And the colors are, are part of my, representing some of my Bauhausian educational upbringing, um, which got very solidified at UPenn, by the way. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so hyphenated is, it's a very viable, important part of my work. And I think for Cubans in general, but I think Caribbean people too. So, thanks so much. Um, so, uh, Thelma, I'm going to go back to you and and ask you to uh, expand a little bit on the work that you are doing on Hispaniola on the on the island that has that is a, a coherent whole, right? It's a that I see in your work this resistance as you were mentioning before to like fraction the island and and eliminate parts of of the reality of Hispaniola. And I know that now in the last 10 years, uh, there have been a lot of studies on Hispaniola. And so I was curious if you're using the Hispaniola as a microcosm to represent the richness uh, of the Caribbean, or what is it that it means for you to use the entire island uh, in your work? All right, so um, 
when I see the 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 Island, the Dominican Republic in Haiti, I think like is it is a microcosmos of the Antillas more than the Caribbean. I I feel like we have of a lot of a lot of uh, is, situation that representing what happened in the Antillas more than the Caribbean, right? Because normally what I see is how many people from different countries and especially from the country with the that they make the official history, no? Right. They go to, to our Iceland and they take vacation there. And when, when they go, it's like uh, parad Paraiso. But when they go back to her country, like, oh, poor people, we need to help and all that thing, no? So um, it is true that we have many conflicts, no? It is true that Dominican Republic have many problems, also Haiti. But also I think we have a, a, um, also we have a work of fraternity, no? And I think we don't talk about, a lot about that. And I know in, in other part of Antillas is the same, in other part of the Caribbean, and it's the same, no? So, so yes, I think it's, it's the, the Iceland is like a microcosmos of, of, of the Antillas more than the Caribbean. I, I can say that, yes. Thanks so much. Um, so Lilian, back to you. Uh, I, I was very happy to see that you're working with the Triptico, the Triptych, and uh, the kind of work that you're doing. You already mentioned a little bit of the Miami, Cuba, and, and some of the juxtapositions that you're doing there. But I was curious about the choice of this particular genre and what kind of work it allows you to do, right? Because uh, by putting together these images, actually both uh, Thelma and you work on with, um, the, with, work with um, juxtapositions as very um, productive category, a, a very productive category, but the triptych also creates a narrative, you know, and so by putting things in contiguity, we end up creating a, a history or a narrative, one it or not. So I wanted to get your take on why the triptych and and what do you think it accomplishes, it allows you accomplish, uh, to accomplish as an artist? So in general, I, I've always liked juxtaposition of things. Um, I've, I'm, you could say I have an eclectic palette, even in decorating. I've always liked something, like I don't like places that look like you went to one store and bought everything. And I think that's always been in, in the back of my head. So I'm not thinking so much in a narrative way as I am in a looking back and forth and in and out and, can, and, and maybe through time. In this case, it's through time and history and different places because I don't I said I don't like staticky stuff. I don't like binary stuff. I I, I, I do you know, maybe I live in too much of a kind of fluid situation, but even when I do my on site works, I choose people often think about or they ask me, when do you know when to stop? Because I'm painting on site over the course of the entire day. The ones that are on site. So you can imagine when you go out to look at something in the morning it looks like a certain way. In the afternoon it looks a different way. So what does the experience of looking at that place actually look like in a two-dimensional image, right? How do you transpose a four-dimensional experience of a three-dimensional place onto a two-dimensional canvas? And the answer is, I don't really know. But, but what I know is when it doesn't look like what I'm looking at, right? So part of it is when there's a, a level of maybe fluidity where you don't really look at any one, where there's not really one subject. Like one thing you might notice is I tend to not paint many open areas or an obvious subject. Because to me, in nature, like in life, you kind of have to focus in and out and travel through it and find things along the way. So I paint all day long because things reveal themselves over time. I can go to the same place every day and it'll be a different painting, although you'll know it's the same place. right? That's kind of my goal. So the hyphenating is just one more level of adding something else. And, and because I paint on site, I've always wanted to be able to paint a different way. And knowing that I can't get to Cuba very easily to paint on site, I did make a series of Angel in Cuba back in uh, 2017 when I was finally able to work in Vinales. Because um, that's where I could identify places where certain artists had painted before. So I could literally follow in their same footsteps and then paint some paintings. But um, the idea of, of, of going back and making multiples is yet another way of finding new connections with things that maybe shouldn't go together, right? And maybe, I mean, I could go on and on and talk about how even 
ideas of uh, you know migration or you know when you put two people from different countries together you get a usually a really neat cool other thing right it's not that you you lose one or the other you now get a third so I really kind of believe in making more with more kind of a maximalist approach to painting and a maximum approach to looking so so this particular one became a triptych because it made just formal sense um, the painting on the right had it had a happened to have a shape that reminded me of the carta painting and then the painting on the left that I'd made earlier had some water that reminded me of the little subtle water uh, in that carta painting that I liked very much so I tend to like to pay homage to, to artists and paintings I like and then I pulled out the colors from my individual paintings in this case to make the albercy squares and then I use Cuban dirt to paint the image so I superimpose this this the actual image on this kind of Bauhausian square but it this this was kind of a formal solution sometimes there's diptychs I've done paintings as much as 15 panels together yeah so I hope I answered your question yes you did and okay. actually like you when we think about the question of the hyphen that you answered before and how yeah this juxtaposition of images is also creating a different kind of answer to the mm -hmm. to the problem of the hyphen, right? That the yeah. choice between two options uh, becomes uh, a, a simplistic question where you compare it to the possibility of more options that yeah. are both visually and auditorially, like, you know, provoking you to, to think about um, different forms of identification, right? And so, so it's very, uh, it, it, it was a very, uh, interesting response uh, in, co in you know in conversation with the notion of the hyphen, and so uh, I'm going to go back to Thelma because the question on, on juxtaposition is also part of her work, and in particular the maps and the cartography that is then put in dialogue with uh, figures that come from uh, some of them are mythical, some seem to come from bestiaries, some seem to come from um, colonial uh, representations of the Americas, and so I wanted to know more about this juxtaposition and this choice of images that you're putting together, we have seen them before. When you look at maps mm -hmm. of the Caribbean historically, we have seen some of these uh, images together, but you are creating a new organization for them, a new way of thinking about them, and I wanted to know more about that. All right, so I prefer the juxtaposition and know the comparison because, and well, my work, uh, when I use the juxtaposition that I do in my work, is a reflection of what I see on the Iceland. If you go to Dominican Republic or you go to Haiti, uh, you're going to see like everything's <laughs> part of everything is, I don't know if some of you go to Dominican Republic, if not, you need to go or go to <laughs> Haiti also. And it's interesting because as much a group of Dominican want to think that it is one to, they want to think that it's easy to make a differentiation about Dominican and Haiti in Haitian. There are more things that are made just but like a juxtaposition, more that comparison, no? Like it's more like it's, it's not easy to compare, to say, oh, you're from Haiti or you're from Dominican Republic. If they don't speak, you don't know, no? <laughs> so, uh, that's something that I notice a lot. And, also in the Dominican Republic, when you go to the street in all the corners, like all the time, that's why for me, when I see the cartography in the school, it's like mm, so impact for me because what I see is like, but what about Haiti? I see ha mm -hmm. Haitians in all the parts and Dominicans, and they, they work in all in different parts of Dominican Republic. And why we don't talk more about her history, why we don't talk more like, and all the time it's like a comparison, like, no, we are better than them, we are no, but for me it's more like, that's why I use the just opposition, no, and that's why I put all like together and try to make a, um, a realismo magico, no, because mm -hmm. for me the Iceland is that, it's a realismo magico. You see things that you say, how they can do that, and they can, no, like, and, and, and it's very interesting, and again, and um, to make a, a comparison, we have the news, and my objective as an artist is to humanize myself. That's another thing. That's why I don't make a comparison and I use the just opposition because that is why I find the, this exercise 
uh, more kinder, more kinder, and and is more kinder in this discourse, and that's why I I don't find interesting make in another way. So that's why for me it's so important to 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 work the collage in this way. Yes. Thank you. And if I may plug uh, uh, the work of Juliet Hooker that in theorizing race in the Americas okay. actually invites us to think about juxtaposition instead of comparison precisely okay. because of uh, some of the things that you're mentioning, Thelma. Uh, you know, if people want to read more, I think it's an interesting question methodologically for many of us to think about uh, how to how to think about different things, how, how to think about difference. Yes. and what are productive ways of, of establishing some dialogues about them, right? Um, so Lillian, I wanted to ask you, I, this was one of the, the things that I learned by looking at your work and also by, by conversing with, uh, with Cecilia, and is that uh, your work actually engages in a dialogue with uh, Domingo Ramos Enriquez, whose work I didn't know. And so I'm assuming that other people may not know his work as, as well. So I wanted for you to explain a little bit about his work and why is that one of the interlocutors of your work? Uh, so Domingo Ramos is uh, was a Cuban artist who was born uh, right around the um, 1900, I think right like 1896 and died like 18, uh, 1956. And he's considered um, what's called, I guess, the Cuban Impressionist. Uh, movement so because but it, it makes sense because of the time he was there but he used heightened color and he was a little more painterly um, and he was also called the painter of Vinales um, um, but for me specifically so so there was a natural attraction to his work because a I could find more of it and it had a little bit more color and it had a sense of of being there over time a little bit for me because that's you know and having that heightened color which I've I do but also just pragmatically his work was the one he painted so much he was so prolific in Vinales in particular that I actually could find more of his work because it's very hard finding work Cuban landscape work that's not either really old or in, the, in Cuba they don't doc you know they're, they're they don't they can't digitize everything so some stuff exists and you don't know it so I found quite a bit of his work but more importantly I could identify the Mogotes in the valley so I go oh I know exactly where this is. So part of my initial idea to go back to Cuba, um, because part of a big irony is I've been working for over 30 years, kind of going across the country and kind of connecting to place and making work. And yet I'd never been able to do that in my whole birth country. So in 2007, I was able to go uh, to Cuba and I had then created, I go, okay, I know exactly where I can go to from this spot. Like I could tell where to go, where that Mogote was. And I then set myself up. I had like five spots from Domingo Ramos paintings that I went and literally kind of tried to follow in his footsteps. Um, so there was those two things that I could identify the places because he painted so much so I could return to them. But then also his palette, he, because he was a bit more modern, um, like the Carta was born in like 1850 and died right around 1900. And he's an amazing painter, but he was more of a traditional, um, you know, traditional painter. And that's not, you know, I'm more of a, you can see my paint and things. So I'm clearly more of an expressionist, exp you know, all this sort of overtimeness, physical painter. So he appealed to me on that kind of visceral material, formal level as well. So Domingo Ramos, look. Find him. He's there's some nice paintings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Domingo and, and, Ramos. Yeah, Domingo Ramos. Yeah, and, and El Museo had actually included a piece that I that I did uh, in 2017. They had a show, and they had a little piece, and that was actually sort of a key piece for me because I was like, I know exactly where that is. I've seen that place, and um, so I did a couple paintings of that particular painting, and part of it too was a way to sort of reclaim, or insert myself into the history of Cuban painting, not actually being. A Cuban painter because I'm of the age where I would have been of that second generation of the Cuban artists. I mean, I would have been going to ESA, I would have been doing all that. I know that, and it was yeah. I said I, I but that didn't happen. So I, I could see this parallel life that could have easily gone one way or the other, um, especially because it. Six weeks after my family left, no one else was leaving. Like they weren't giving out any more. Like that was the last sign up. Then people were leaving, but no one else could sign up to leave. So we were literally the tail end of the people 
who were able to leave in the first wave. So that's six weeks my aunt didn't leave. So my only aunt and cousin are over there. So I could have literally been of that Cuban, you know, so I think about that when I first met the Cuban artists and so forth. So don't said this going to Domingo is just a way to me to said to some degree um, also connect with Cuban landscape painting. Thank you. Um, so Thelma, uh, I wanted to ask you about um, your work on islands uh, and as a as a island born <laughs> person as well from Puerto Rico. Uh, you, looking at your work uh, was very important because you I felt that you were pushing against this idea of islands as fragments as something that is marginal or is minor and to think about islands as a place of plenitude and as a place that, would, that could become a microcosm of something bigger. And so while doing that, while looking at your work, um, I remember MSSR's journey in the notebook uh, of A Return to the Native Land, a uh, text that begins with a very uh, representation of the islands as, as places of marginality and illness and uh, and I, I did send you some passages that I was thinking about, but I'm gonna read very briefly of, of two of them. Uh, there is a representation at the beginning of the poem of the Caribbean as a tepid bubbling pecked by uh, seabirds and, uh, a, and a beach of dreams uh, with an insane awakening, right? At the beginning is this illness, this lack. And at the end, there is this, at the end of the, the journey that the poem traces, there is this idea of the islands and the people that comes from Africa and from the Caribbean becoming the center of history, right? And so it's a place of plenitude, right? A place of, of uh, that contains everything. And so I was curious about the work that you're doing with islands and the way that that is allowing you to look back at the Caribbean uh, and to try to push against many of the stereotypes of the insular as, as minor, as not enough, as not continental. So, my work speak of a radical brotherhood. I have uh, no thought about how my work transformed the notion of the insular. Um, but now that you speak about this, I think, and the only thing I can say is I hope that my work invite us to look at the insular has a space where it is not looked at uh, with so much anger. I'm not saying, I'm not saying forget history, all right? I don't say that. I think the history is very important. We need to know about the history and for not repeat something, right? But what I try to say with this, and we say ojo in my country, like ojo with this, <laughs> But I say we need to build in peace on the ashes of all that pain, no? I think all the time thinking in, you know, like, like what we need to do with, I'm, what I feel in the Iceland particularly, because that my work talk about the Iceland, is that we are all the time anger. The people outside don't think about that because they see us like a place to you go and you have a nice vacation and when you go like i say some minutes ago mm -hmm. it's a poor people but when you are there when you are in the car we see the anger when you see the corruption in the country you see the anger and everybody looks so anger all the time and also happened in haiti because uh, for do my work I told with a lot of Haitian people who live in different part of the world, especially with Haitian who moved to Chile. I have a connection with a lot of friends who live there. And when we talk about this, and we talk a lot about this, we think in that, we, we notice that we are very anger, and I think we need to, to work with that and think more in 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 build peace, building peace, no? With with and and I that's something that I want to when the when the people think in Dominican Republic in Haiti, I want to think more the people think more in fraternity and and but first my world all the time think about what happened inside. I don't think a lot how the people see us. 
I don't think a lot of that because I think all the time we live thinking in that, like we want to go out, we want to get, take a boat and go to Puerto Rico. We got, uh, the Haitian want to take a boat and go to other parts or go to Dominican Republic it's all the time running. And, and so this question is something that I'm going to think, but in my, in my work, what I do is think about what happened inside and, and what, what we need to change. Thank you so much. I, I, I can tell you that looking at the exhibition and the kind of work that is being done during, you know, at Penn right now, I feel happy about the change, right? It's important. I think part of the anger is not finding anything or almost no, no representation or yeah. reference uh, to the place that you come from. And um, I'm happy that that's, that's changing, right? Um, and so my question to you, Lillian, is similar because I saw that you use uh, soil and dirt from like, you know, from Cuba and bring it to you some of the, to, to construct some of the landscapes that, that you are representing in your, in your art. And that obviously it made me think immediately about Ana Mendieta uh, and the Sculturas Rupestres, but in a way that I thought you were doing something similar gesture, but in contra, like uh, also in reverse in a way, because you were not going back there to imprint the image or you were bringing the soil back to actually make it talk in a different context, right? And it made me think about um, a quote from Mendieta, mm. Allá cuando se muere la tierra que nos cubre, habla. And I'm not going to read the translation because the only translation I found is a little bit imperfect. So I think that it will have to live on its own, right? But I wanted to know a little bit more about the work that you do with the, the, the bringing materials, you know, materials from from Cuba to using your landscapes and also any dialogue that may, may inform your work and Mendieta's work. So um, Ana Mendieta was one of the early artists that did um, leave a huge impression on me. And actually, um, she would have been just, I think, half a generation older than me or something. Um, so, um, but my work is very different. I mean, I really do identify as a painter primarily. I always have. I've always loved the material of paint. So while I love Ana, um, I never could figure out how to do any work that either paid homage or really built on her work that didn't seem like I was just doing her work, right? So I, I so, so I, yeah, I think about her, but I never did anything, but I always wanted to do something. So um, when I went to Cuba and did the Echo en Cuba series, Made in Cuba, I had to change. I couldn't use the normal materials I used because I had to take everything to Cuba. So I worked with acrylic and on paper, and I would take everything with me, you know, make the, everything was fairly small. So the idea was when I came back that that work would inspire me to do more work. But as an on-site landscape painter, and I, and I emphasize the on-site because for me being on-site is important, not because it's important because I want to make a connection to place. So if I'm not physically in the place, I mean, I could take a photograph and copy it. I mean, that's, I mean, that's easy. I mean, I mean, I come from a photorealist background, but that doesn't interest me. Because my work isn't about that, it's about connecting. So the idea of being in a place, looking at it and painting it, and I'm not trying to copy it. I mean, um, Astrid's um, uh, Niemann's, uh, uh statement about how you can't, you can't ever represent nature without colonizing. And I'm not trying to reproduce or represent nature. I'm in nature trying to experience it. And it's informing my, you know, I'm just really trying to grab a little bit and show, and that's how I can maybe show the you all how I feel or a little bit of, of my experience in nature. So I'm not trying to copy nature, reproduce it. I'm just showing you my experience in it. But with the dirt, so I come back and I think, how can I now, as an on-site landscape painter, make work about a place that I'm no longer at? Right? And at first I thought, oh, I'll take these on-site paintings and I'll just take a couple of them and make new paintings from them. And I did that. And it bored me to tears. I mean, as soon as I started, when I just was like, what am I doing? I'm making paintings that kind of look a little bit more like my other on-site paintings, but they're not on-site. So I pretty much immediately said, I've got to find another way. So how can I be true as an on-site landscape painter? And I thought, well, if I use the site, I'm still an on-site landscape painter because I'm using the site. So I had to shift from a perceptually based mode to a conceptually based mode of thinking about the Cuban landscape. And so I had brought back pigment, pigment. 
uh, from Cuba. Um, knowing, you know, I, I put that in the back of my because I, you know, everyone likes to artists. A lot of us like to play with dirt, and like so, I married material. So you know, I scooped up a little bit, and I nuked it, and I did all that good stuff. But so I had that in my back pocket, and then I thought, okay, I'm just gonna. That makes sense. Paint the landscape. So I had taken, I don't take photographs to, um, to paint from. I kind of take photographs of different things, colors, flowers, people. Um, but I used some of my paintings and, and I went through my random photographs and I thought, okay, I'm, now I'm gonna make images with the dirt. So I did one with a, a basic color and then I thought, okay, but the color has to mean something too. <coughs> yeah, I can't just use a random color. So I thought, where, how can I introduce color in a way that makes sense? And so the one in the back with, uh, with a Seba tree, um, the, I did a series where the Echo con Cuba pieces, made with Cuba, the Bauhausian squares were based on the colors of the houses in the Vinales Valley, because that's what I took a lot of pictures of, were the houses. And I met people, and so I had a whole list of you know these houses, and I thought, that's it. I can now use these as colors. And then also once once I do that, because the artists in the room will know this. We don't know we don't know everything. Often we don't even have an idea. I mean, I'm not idea driven. I'm kind of I, I make work and then the ideas that are embedded start coming out. And so um, so one of the things that happened is that go, yeah, well that also makes sense because the whole Bauhausian, my upbringing and me always wanting to break the grid. Right, you know, although I respect the grid, I appreciate it, but again, the more can be more, not less is less type of thing. So, so that's where the grid came from, is it gave me color and it gave me another vernacular reason to, for choosing those colors that goes against maybe the more kind of Western thing. Although, you know, Albers did go and, you know, do stuff in the different parts of the, of, of the country. But, so the dirt was very important and, and so there was always, so I felt proud that although I didn't directly pay homage to Anna, there was a piece, it's on my website, there is a piece that that I finally made a piece that paid homage directly to her, and it's called homage, it's called um, yeah, homage to, to Anna. And I made, I painted my favorite Mogolte, and then I've always loved her body tracks piece. So after I quickly painted my Mogolte, I had someone photograph me, and I put my hands at the very top, and I did the, that hand gesture. Yeah, and that one, I said, that's it. This one's still me, but it's paying homage to her. So, yeah. So I do think about her all the time. You know, I wish she were still alive. Um, Thanks. Uh, so I have a, a couple of questions that are for both of you. And then um, I don't know if we're going to open to questions that will need some help from the organizers. No. but. <laughs> But let's just, uh, I had a, a, two questions. The first one is the notion of the archipelago that I saw appeared um, in some of the statements about the project. And uh, and I was curious about the, the res if, if it resonates with your work or if it's not resonating, there's no problem. I'm not uh, converting anybody, right? In my case, the archipelago gave me an opportunity of connecting the Caribbean with other islands that had similar experiences in, in context of colonialism. But uh, but I was curious about, you know, how, if, if this is a term that, that is resonating in your work or if you are using other terms or keywords that are informing your conceptualization of, of the islands or the Caribbean more collectively. Well, uh, how I say some minutes ago, uh, I all the time work with the Iceland only and I, and my discourse is about what happened inside of the Iceland. And, and more than, well, the other day I told with a friend and she is from Martinica. And, and she asked me if I go to other Iceland of the Antillas mm -hmm. and I say, no, I never <laughs> go to. And I need to admit that I don't feel connect with, I can talk about something like in Puerto Rico, we have some food similar or, yeah. or with the Cuban, yeah. but I don't feel a connection. I need to be very sincerely with that. I don't feel a connection. And, uh, and I, well, I, I think a lot of my work thinking in, in what happened in Dominican Republic in Haiti, because for me that's, well, it's something that, that moved me a lot. So. I don't. I don't feel connection with the idea of of archipelagos or the idea of other Islam. Um, 
but well, I don't know in the future, I want to go to, to, to the Iceland in the Antillas more than Caribbean. I feel more connected with the Iceland more than like Venezuela or other countries from the Caribbean, like some, some uh, areas from Colombia, no? But I feel more connection with Iceland, uh, with the people of the Iceland, but, but not a lot. <laughs> And um, I think for me, because I've lived in outside, you know, I did not grow up on the island. Yes. Um, for me, it's 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 more of of actually not realizing how much I still was connected to the island or to those histories. You know, I, I think we do. Um, I think we generationally inherit things that we don't even know. Um, and when I was invited to be in, in relational undercurrents in two thousand. Was that 15? Oh, 17, okay. <laughs> COVID, COVID head, right? Um, that, that was really eye-opening for me because you, there were people from literally all these different islands that speak different languages that normally are not put together, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, what really is, you know, what is the Caribbean, right? What's the diaspora? Because I consider myself deep from deep diasporic position, right, coming to this. Um, it was amazing it was like one of the best shows i've ever been in in terms of communicating with artists i met all these people whose either work i'd seen and liked or maybe i didn't know and met and it was like instant conversations about themes and just relating and understanding even if i wasn't from that island and i don't always feel that way when i'm in shows of florida artist or you know texas artist that i lived there 30 years in texas and so um so while I don't actively think about it, Yolanda, I mean, I, I'm, you know, it's not actively on my mind. I think there's so many deep connections that often get brought out from people who are uh, from, I guess, the the Caribbean, you know, the archipelagos and, and so forth. So, so I've said, I don't know quite if I answered your question, <laughs> but... Um... Yes, you have. You okay. have. Uh, okay. <laughs> It was a curiosity given that the fact that you were in the undercurrent succeeded. So I was I was curious about about that. Um, okay. So my final question actually has to do with the invitation to participate in this event and uh, and to be part of this exhibition. And uh, I, I was told that you had an opportunity of seeing the exhibit uh, already. And so I'm, I'm imagining, you know, because I'm not an artist, that seeing your work exhibited in a collection gives you a new reading, right? A new perception of your own work in dialogue with the with the other uh, artists that are included, but also with the proposal that Cecilia put together, right? And so I wanted to get just your impressions about um, how do you feel, how is your work in, uh, located in this, in this uh, exhibit and what kinds of conversations you feel that are being showcased by, by putting it together with the other artists that are in the exhibit uh, here at, at, at Penn. All right, well, uh, first I like the part, well, I love when they, the part of, they put my, my pieces because they have, it, they have a table in the middle of the space. So I think in the Iceland, like, and it's cute for me when I see it, then I see the Iceland, I, I, I thinking that the, the, this uh, conversation is going to be there. I was thinking, oh, and I say, my mom, oh, it's going to be something very uh, familiar because it's in a table. <laughs> but later I see this room and I say, oh, all right, no, it's not there, but I like it. And the more important about this process for me is that I, I take a lot of questions to think. And for me, that is important because of that. I am so in, in the Iceland. So with all this question and this conversation, I have, mm, I want to go out and see like, mm, no, not be with the zoom in. I'm going to do a zoom out. So, so I like the process and the, and I want to say thank you again to Ceci because um, they make the connection and, and I like it, yes. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of artists in here uh, whose work, actually, almost everybody's work I knew in the show. Um, and um, I'll, I'll point to Nadia's work. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan. Um, 
you know, I, I think if I were a photographer, I'd want to be Nadia. Um, <laughs> um, I really relate to the work. Um, you really should go to her webpage. She has all these amazing different bodies of work, but they're, yet you'll know they're hers. Um, Jordy's work um, also has a number of different interesting bodies of work. Um, and although her pieces are, are much more pointed about um, exoticism and colonialism um, and it's kind of direct um, I guess consequences right on on the islands there's a lot of other little elements that that I've I've always kind of related to um, in kind of in my own kind of life and ideas but I don't do direct work about it so I think you know all the work and even Thelma's like I'd never seen your work in real life which was super <laughs> exciting because um, I actually recently did a work that it had a map in it couple maps, three different maps in it, um, tracing some genealogical stuff with, with plant things. But, but your work very much resonated with me because of this idea of magical realism, I think it's, um, I know it's a big Latin American theme in general. Um, and, you know, I guess I, I don't know enough about this to know if, if, but to me, magical realism also was something that I always liked as a child reading, like I liked reading Bodhis. Um, <laughs> I liked those sentences that were a whole page long. They did not bother me um, that they were a whole page long. They made sense. And so against, it kind of goes against the less is more thing, maybe. Um, so this is, it's very exciting because you, you, you feel kind of like it makes sense, but you also get excited about, oh yeah, wow, I was kind of thinking about something like that. So, so um, oh, and Deborah Jack's work, if you don't, if uh, it's not in this space, but Deborah Jack's work, um, I think is really poetic, but it's also, I think she really captures the themes of not just many themes, but for me, a particular one is this idea of water. Cause I think when you're from an island and although I'm no longer on the island, you know, my, there's family on the island, right? You know, you are, you're surrounded by this, right? So it's 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 beautiful, but it's also a little bit of a you got to get past that water, right, to get out. And so not not everyone can do that. And it makes me um, so I can't look at the water without not just thinking it's beautiful, but thinking it's also a barrier, yes. um, and um, and one that not everyone can cross. So um, it's a very powerful show. There's a lot of things. Um, and I hope that actually, I see you see Yolanda back there. There's a there's a, a piece that involves uh, community um, and reflection, and I'm looking forward to being able to contribute to that to be part of the fabric. So um, yeah, I think it's very invigorating. I mean, I've met a lot of people, and uh, I know that we're gonna be doing stuff in the future. So um, I got a little off topic because I got super excited, but um, <laughs> sorry. Okay, that's okay. So uh, those were my questions. I don't know if we're going to open the floor to questions or not. Uh, so, oh. yes, um, actually, yeah, we do have like five minutes or so for questions. So if anyone wants to ask a question to anyone, actually, <laughs> um, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. I think they have a mic over there, yeah. I'm sorry, thanks. So thank you again uh, for um, your work and for uh, sharing with us um, all the process. I know that for artists it's sometimes difficult to explain themselves <laughs> because as you said, Lillian, uh, you just, you don't know. So there was the light and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I have actually, yes, the question is sent, the two questions, uh, uh, like, Yes, the question in general is centered on experience and uh, how the diasporic experience is, because I know it's clearly cl clear uh, in, on, your, on your work because of the hyphen. And uh, actually when you were talking about I, I just wanted to ask you, Lillian, if the hyphen was somehow the, uh, the, the um, was what in your work was uh, transmitting this experience, any kind of uh, movement, so the, this experience in general, it, mm -hmm. not only as a, in a diasporic experience, but how, because I was thinking also the transmission of um, exactly that, uh, when you were in a place with uh, that light and uh, maybe the sounds and uh, 
uh, so if this hyphenation included not only that diasporic elements of your work, but also um, um, everything in experience. And then related, more and more, and more um, related to your work, I really like it when you said, well, I, I'm trying to um, somehow, not exactly, it's late and I'm tired, but <laughs> somehow you said something that you are more interested in the people inside, but it's happening, so the experiences, that's why I center the question on experience. Uh, the experience inside, of the, in this case, the island uh, of uh, Les, Les Col Española, even though it's, <laughs> a na it's a name even that has to be <laughs> And this is my, the point to your, your side of the question, is the maps and the experience. Um, I wonder, just wondering, if at any moment, if it become problematic for you to use m the cartography uh, you know the co the cartography from the colonizing the co the colonizer, and uh, the question is how the inter so the the internal experiences of the people, um, both in Haiti and the Dominican Republic in your case on this La Española, how those experiences can be read in those maps. Not I know it's not just the maps; it's your recreation actually of the maps. So I don't know if I've been clear with both. One more through the hyphen experience <laughs> and then the maps and the internal experience within the island. Well, let me check. Let me see if I understand. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, um, well, first, and um, I think in the island when I moved to Barcelona. When I moved to Barcelona in 2016, I go to a study uh, a master in history because I have a, a lot of lagunas from the school. So I say I need to, to learn history. Well, I know the history have many no? uh, uh, points that something that they say or they know all that thing. But when I go to, uh, to Barcelona, I think in the map, because when I live in the island, I, I make a lot, of, a lot of picture. I go to different places of um, comunidades con, eh, con problemáticas de hacinamiento. Mm -hmm. So in that uh, places, I see a lot of Haitians and Dominicans. So when I go to Barcelona, and in the beginning of the pandemia, is the moment when I take the maps, and I think in the maps. And, and well, if I understand, and about the people. Well, first, you, you tell me something about if I have problem with the... Yes. Well, um, I work a lot because I just, I just don't, I don't work only with the maps. If you see my work, I always, I also work with a collage of people from Dominican Republic and people from Haiti, and I make a collage with that, not with directly her face, uh, just if the people let me to take the pictures, but. Uh, it, this is a process right now, no? So for me, it's also like make me question about the cartography also. Yeah. That's why in, in the cartography, I try to, to show also uh, the like 
the conflict, no? Like we are in this yeah, map, right. like we are, yeah. they think we are this. Yeah. But yeah. if you do a zoom, in, you're gonna see other thing. And that's when, if you, you see my work, when you see the map, later you need to see the, the collage that I do with the people, because, because that's the zoom in, right? So it's a connection. We don't put here in much of the people we were more this with the idea of the cartography, right? But that's what I tried to do, right? Like, mm -hmm. and it's a process right now, right? I need, I know this is going to grow up more, and and I I voy a aprender cosas de mí misma, no? De mi investigation, and and well, it's that it's something that like the map that I do here the, with the stitch, like is ruido. How you say? Uh, yeah, it's like a noise. Yeah, no, no, it's like oh, okay, a noise. Okay. It's something like, it's something like I don't understand. Uh, is is what you say? Something that they say this is like that, but I don't do the map exactly that they are. Yeah. Like sometimes I try to move something, or or sometimes people say me, you don't put samana, or you don't put this. No, they they interesting to more of that than the the discourse that mm -hmm. i try to 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 give to my work yes and um so and with the the, the hyphenation um actually i'm gonna i think i'm gonna read i there is a there's a definition because i actually looked up the definition of, of hyphen um i mean we know that it's to connect or divide but a noun means a person who does multiple functions so i am uh, a hyph you know I am a hyphenate in a way right um, and so the words very appealing on on many many levels to me but yes I want to hyphenate formally I want to hyphenate um, more but actually I'm, I'm thinking again of Yolanda and her sewing that she's gonna do because in a way you can visualize the the hyphen as a thread right to kind of connect more things right so um, I like putting things together and finding new things right so I like hyphenating things um, and um, and maybe I'll, I mean I'll kind of close with me on this kind of you know being so deeply diasporic, and having this yearning need to feel connected, but knowing that the place you kind of want to be connected to you can't be connected to, and yet you're colored right your whole life. You were fully defined by where you came from that you can never go back to, and 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 unlike other people in the Caribbean who can at least visit their islands. It is very difficult for me to do that. And I, you know, and so, so, but yet I don't want to give that up. I can't give that up, right? So there, so it's always been this, this connection to place, right? Identity, you know, sense of place, really, um, you need to have a sense of place and belonging, right? Um, and that's what I've been searching for. And I think the hyphen, you know, in my name, I'm glad I have a hyphen in my name, but those of you, does anyone have a hyphen in their name in here? Okay. Now some machines will take a hyphen, but for the most part, this has been, you know, and I'm, you know, I embrace it. I, my daughters have a hyphenated name, Coño. <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, it means a lot to me. Okay, I think um, we can continue this conversation better with all of them um, having some wine, having some cheese, <laughs> and looking around at the art as well. So, um, well, let me thank you again, both of you, and also Yolanda virtually. Thank you so much. Thank this you, worked Yolanda. really well. I'm really happy yeah. <laughs> that it, it was actually a conversation. So thank you yeah. for joining us virtually as well. Um, and please let me... <laughs> thank you, Yolanda. <laughs> And well, now you can um, wander around and we're all gonna be here, but I just wanted to say that there's a third artist with us, um, as Lillian was commenting before. Um, her name is Joanna Castillo Marcelino. And I'm gonna briefly read her bio and introduce her work so we can all move over there. Um, so uh, Joanna Karina Castillo Marcelino is a connectora, artist, textile designer, creative directress, whose work explores human connections, the divine feminine, the now, other worlds, portals, healthy circularities, repair and sustainability from the perspective of her lived experiences as a response to imposed realities, identities, and linear notions of time, 
climate change and hyperconsumption. Only that. <laughs> um, in the form of kilts, embroidery, and collages made of reclaimed textiles, secondhand and old clothes, digital based tapestries, collaborative installations, nuts, integrative looms, questions, prints, and workshops. She received her BFA in fashion design at Altos de Chavon and Parsons, the new school in 2017, where she specialized in materiality, focusing on textiles as a, as a discursive element to create community, from the individual to the collective. Um, I'm going to go and introduce briefly your work now. She's going to do um, a project titled Portal 3, Love Maps, Water Holds Memory, um, where she is answering the question, hey, how am I saying yes to the unknown today? Um, and this started as a series which acts under the premise of one story as a living thing always, and how it always has many versions of it. So Love Maps, What a Hold Memory is about exploring and collectively wondering about the pot potentiality of identity, time, space, textiles and water using the present intuition, change, multiplicity, free association, communion as its main catalyst. So you are all more than welcome to activate the peace with her and by responding to the question, how am I saying yes to the unknown today? And you can use your words, textiles, but I'm going to let Joanna talk about that in the other room. So please, um, I think another round of applause and then we can go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know who should. Okay, let me. 